How's it going guys? My name is Josiah Willis and I'm a real estate agent with Caliber Real Estate here in Bellevue. We're in our Bellevue office today. I have James Mallory with Environix with me today and we're going to be discussing uh, what he does in his company Environix but he's actually a uh, lead, asbestos and mold remediation and removal specialist and he's going to be sharing with you a little bit today about what the process looks like if you're a buyer or seller looking to buy or sell a home that may have some of these environmental issues come up. So he's going to be sharing with us his knowledge and uh, you're going to probably learn a lot. So make sure to, to place your phones on silent, get off Facebook, grab a, something for notes and note taking and uh, pay attention because you're going to learn a lot in this and you may even save yourself lots of money and headache. So uh, we're going to get started here. Um, James, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? I run Environix. We're an indoor environmental testing and cleanup company. Like you mentioned, our main specialties are mold, lead, asbestos, basically anything that goes wrong inside of a, inside of a house or building. Okay. I've been at this for about 16 years now and do around 2,000 inspections a year. Nice. And are you mainly in King, Snohomish, Pierce? Where, where are you? Yeah, that basically covers it. Okay. We, do, we get out to the islands a fair bit as well, okay. over to Bainbridge and Bremerton. But yeah, the core is King, Pierce, and Snohomish County. Awesome. Okay, so why don't you take us to the next slide and uh, show us a happenstance of mold that some people might not know the answer to. Sure. Ask them a quick question. Okay, quiz time. So this is a house where mold was found throughout all of the wall cavities. The homeowner was installing some uh, built-in bookshelves and demoed out some of the sheetrock and as you can see found mold growth all on the exterior sheathing. Now keep this thought in mind, uh, this, this particular house. And I'm going to show you a completely different home. This is the same house still where uh, the built-in bookshelves were being built and the mold growth was found. After the mold was found here, she went throughout the house tearing off pieces of sheet rock to see if there was mold in other places. And everywhere she pulled the sheet rock off, mold was found in the wall cavities. Wow. There's another home, completely different, where no visible mold whatsoever. When we entered this basement area, we noticed a really strong musty odor, pretty intense, but no visible mold growing anywhere. It was uh, mostly used for storage. Now this carpet, this area rug down here, was damp to the touch. Uh, when we pulled the carpet back, you could see a little bit of uh, moisture on the back side of the carpet and on the concrete. We took a sample in both of these homes to see uh, if there was elevated levels of mold spores. In a little bit, we'll walk you through the surprising results of those tests. And it points a lot to the confusion around mold and the importance of really getting to the source of it before we make judgment calls. Mm, that's awesome. Okay, one question I want to ask, because I think the audience may want to know, is um, what kinds of mold are there? Is that even important? Um, can you tell us a little, a little bit about what you know, mold you kind of come across on a daily basis? Sure. It's a great question. We get it a lot. People will ask questions like, uh, can you come test my house for black mold, for toxic mold, or a specific type, say stachybotrys, and, and they're very curious about this. In reality, there are tens of thousands of types of molds out wow. there, um, way more than you can test for. And every person is sensitive uh, individually to different types of molds. Hmm. So one person can walk into a room with a mold issue and have a pretty intense reaction. The next person walks in and feels absolutely nothing. Like other allergens, it's very specific to that individual. Wow. So that tells us something about that question of what type of mold do I have. Right. We're less concerned with this exact type of mold. We're much more concerned with whether there is an elevated level of that mold spore. Got it. You'd spend so much money trying to figure out, is this specific species of mold found in your house? And is each person in your home sensitive to that? Then you'd spend fixing the problem in the first place. Okay. So, so basically, the... the Correct me if I'm wrong, but the actual spore count is really what you're looking at? Exactly. The spore count is everything. That's a measurement of how many spores are in a cubic meter of air. Hmm. Now that's tested inside of a home and outside of a home. Something that a lot of people don't understand is that mold is ubiquitous. Even the cleanest house uh, out there is going to have mold spores in the home. Oh, wow. Why? Because they float in through the windows and doors from the outside. Mold is in, in the outside environment in all locations. So we're really concerned with whether there is elevated levels uh, above and beyond what's normal in the outside air. Got it. Okay. So you have to kind of take a baseline by testing outside air. Exactly. Okay. Now we use averages for the outside air because it helps smooth out the week-to-week uh, -week fluctuations day-to-day. You can have a 
really low spore count right after it snowed or it rained and a really high spore count after it's windy. So we want to look at an average Interesting. comparison. Now it also changes a lot season by season, mm -hmm. right? In the fall when the leaves are on the ground and they're rotting away, well that rot is created by mold. Mm -hmm. So it's sending off large quantities of mold spores. The inside of your home, if you measured a really high amount of those specific mold spores in October, well, you'd know this is likely not from an inside source of growth. It's just floating in from the outside air. Okay. If those same spores were found in June at a high level, and say, oh, this is probably an indication that you have a problem in your home, that it's actually growing inside your house somewhere, and we, now we need to go find it. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So in terms of, for our viewers, to be more specific, I think, can you tell, kind of take us through uh, what a uh, mold spore is, and isn't it sort of like the way mold actually gives off seeds to be spread around? That's what a spore is in the air? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, a seed is a great analogy to it. Okay. And much like a seed from a tree, it needs the right conditions to grow, to propagate. So mold spores are on every surface in your house right now. What's keeping them from growing is not a lack of sufficient spores, it's a lack of uh, excess moisture. Well, excess for us, but right. the proper amount of moisture for them. Right. So we are after identifying whether a home has these conditions that are conducive to mold growth. The main thing we can control is moisture. Right? Yeah. We can't control the food source. Most building materials in a home are an available food source for mold, but we can control is the moisture. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, let's uh, we're going to get back to this. Um, so stay tuned to the end because you're going to find out more about what actually is more harmful. The earlier photo that he showed with um, the mold all throughout the walls versus this, this basement with this wet rug. So we'll get to that soon, but we'll move on to the next part. Okay, so why don't you take us through some common mistakes? Like what are we looking at here in terms of uh, what the source of the mold is and I guess what type of mold, if that's even what you want to talk about. But yeah, take us through what we're looking at right here. Sure. This is a closet and a bit of mold growth on the ceiling, right where the ceiling meets the exterior wall. The same home had mold growth in several different areas throughout the house. It's a little bit of a grainy shot, but you could see mold growth all along the exterior walls where the ceiling meets it. Hmm. Now this type of growth throws a lot of people off. The most common answers I get are, uh, say, gutter failure, which makes sense. It's right where your gutters are, always on the exterior edge of a house. You can also hear, say, roof leak. Now, that's a good guess, too. Flashing failure, water is getting in right at the roof line. Good guesses, but none of them are correct. The correct answer is condensation. I'll show you a slide really? here in a second. That's crazy. It points to it. Yeah. The good news is, because it's condensation, the mold is only growing where you see it. If you were to crawl up into the attic and look on the back side of this, you would not find any mold growth whatsoever. Wow. It means it doesn't need to be torn off. It can be cleaned and remediated in place. Now, let me show you another photo that points to uh, the same thing, but an even more vivid example. Mm. Okay, so here is a similar mold growth on a ceiling, but you can even see the brown outline on the outside of it that typically we associate with a roof leak. Mm. Most homeowners, if they saw something like this, would call a roofer and say, hey, I think I've got a leak. Can you help track it down? Now, if you point this uh, thermal, with a thermal imaging camera, something really interesting happens. Hmm. Notice the yellow rectangles. Those represent temperature differences. The temperature differences, now this shot was in the summer, so it's actually showing excess heat. In the winter, it would show a cold spot. What's happening on that photo, if we go back and take a look at it, is condensation is occurring on a cold spot. So you have warm, humid air from inside the home floating up. It hits these cold spots on the ceiling and condenses out hmm. over time. Well, now we've created those conditions that are conducive for mold. Hmm. Elevated moisture. The sheetrock is plenty good food source. Now we've got sufficient water. So correct me if I'm wrong, but condensation in terms of mold is essentially like uh, outside when there's dew on the grass, right? It gets to a certain point where it changes temperature and then the moisture in the air can't be held in the air anymore. And then it gets released and it becomes water. Instead of water vapor, it becomes actual water droplets. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. If we go back to the mold photo here, what happened is this ceiling got so cold over time that the moisture in the air was forced to condense out onto that surface. Mm. It was probably only 10, 15 degrees cooler than the adjacent ceiling, but that was enough to cause condensation. Mm. Now in a dry environment, 
uh, Colorado, Montana, something like that, this is much less likely to happen because the air inside your home is much drier, so there's less moisture to condense out in the first place. Got it. In our climate, with high winter humidity, uh, this is much more common for us, probably more so than any other part of the country. Okay. This is, we're kind of right on that threshold or edge for condensation on a surface. Okay, and is that why it kind of looks speckled on the, on the ceiling is, besides like the water stains around it, is because it's condensation droplets? Would that be fair? That's part of it, but that can be deceptive. Okay. I'll show you some photos a little bit later on that point to this where you can have speckling from even a flooding event. Really? Yeah, so it's, you definitely um, would not want to make a conclusive judgment based on the growth pattern of mold. Okay. Uh, the gold standard is, Moisture meter, thermal imaging, we want hard proof of what caused that moisture in the first place. Okay, so those are two main tools that you use to diagnose the problem, moisture meter and a thermal in imager? Yes, exactly. Okay. So this, was ta this inspection here was done in the summer months where the thermal imaging camera was helpful and a moisture meter would be uh, pretty worthless, right? Because A, it hasn't rained in weeks, mm. so you can't... I, um, rule in or rule out a roof leak right and if it's condensation condensation typically doesn't produce enough moisture to show up on a moisture meter oh really it's enough to cause mold but not to show up on a moisture meter because it's just happening on the thin little surface uh, which is why it doesn't usually structurally degrade the sheetrock because it's the moisture is right on the outer edge mm. it doesn't go all the way through it this is where a thermal imaging camera is great and in this shot you can see the the spots are highlighted very clearly and they perfectly correlate with where the mole growth was found. So we can make a, a good judgment call on, well, there's missing insulation clearly and it happens to be exactly where the mole growth was occurring and, and extrapolate that to what's happening in the winter. Got it, okay. Awesome, well, I guess let's go on to the next one. Tell us more about what to expect in the next slide. Okay, here are some other shots of an exterior wall. Now. This we see much more commonly in older homes, right? You pull a bed or a couch back from an exterior wall and you see mold growth occurring behind it. I find most homeowners get this one right. It's, mm -hmm. it's more intuitive. Yes, they know they've got an older home. You've probably got poorly insulated walls. The bedding was too close to the edge and you get condensation mm -hmm. and mold growth. Okay, so this, this is another example of condensation. This is condensation. So the same thing applies if you're at a tear off this sheetrock and look on the back side, you would see nothing. Because hmm. the mold only grows on the warm side of the wall, the side facing the inside of the home. Hmm. Not inside the, the wall cavity where the insulation and then the exterior sheathing are. Hmm. Okay. Now, solutions for this are, there are a couple different ways you can go with this. Obviously, upgrading the insulation in the exterior wall would be great, but that's a pretty expensive proposition. Absolutely. Uh, it's done, you know, in older homes often from the outside, but, but it's not cheap and it's often done incorrectly. Uh, as a short-term preventative, this can be fixed with keeping a good three to four inch air gap from your exterior walls, and most importantly, improving the ventilation. Mm. You've got to get this humid air out of the house so there's less of it to condense in the first place. Got it, okay, so in some circumstances, correct me if I'm wrong, but a inspector might diagnose this wrong and say you need to actually replace all the sheetrock and that could cost the homeowner um, lots of money, right? Whereas they could actually do um, hire you and have remediation be a lot less expensive than they anticipated. Is that right? Yeah, we see that a lot. You know, the worst calls are when somebody says, uh, "Hey, I found some mold growth on my sheetrock in the basement, so I hired a contractor and we tore off the bottom four feet, and now we want you to come out and find the source of the leak." Mm. Uh, sometimes there's a leak, but often what we go out and find is that there was no leak. It was from humidity and condensation, poor <laughs> airflow. Oh man! All the sheetrock was torn out for no reason. Oh. Right? A uh, bath fan would have solved the problem going forward. Wow! So it's really important to separate out humidity-based mold condensation versus liquid water intrusion. You know, groundwater, pipe, roof leak. Those are the two big distinctions because it totally changes how you're going to fix a problem. Okay. Good to know. Wow! This is another closet. Is that a closet? This is another closet. I, I uh, show you this slide to point out how intense condensation can get. Wow. This is as bad as it is, is still all from humidity and condensation. So wow. same thing. You tear all that sheetrock off, look on the back side, the framing is going to be spotless, the, sh the insulation will be spotless, no damage whatsoever. Hmm. 
Uh, now, this is a pretty intense scenario, so you might want to tear the sheetrock off anyways <laughs> because it's, it's really <laughs> heavy growth. Closets are always the worst. You have no heat source in there, very little ventilation. Often, homeowners are taking plastic bags, garbage bags full of clothes or something and shoving them in there for months or years at a time so you don't get that airflow. Hmm. Now, I would not expect to see this on a house built in the last 10 years because you have so much better insulation next to your walls and better ventilation. Uh, kind of with each decade you go in the past, this becomes more common. Mm, interesting. So it sounds like something you keep repeating over and over is ventilation is a huge issue with mold, right? Having proper ventilation, getting airflow, and probably to get equalizing of temperature, right? Throughout the house. Yeah, yep. It's, it's a bit surprising in our climate, but bringing in outside air will always lower the humidity. Now, this wouldn't work in Florida where it's 90 degrees and 90% humidity, <laughs> right, right? Right. In our climate, all of our humidity problems happen in the winter when it's humid and cold. So we bring that cold, wet air in the house, heat it up just through our natural uh, HVAC system, mm. and that humidity drops way down, even if it's 35 degrees and raining, 100% humidity. You bring that cold, wet air, heat it up to 68, 70 degrees, all of a sudden your humidity drops from 100% down to say 45. Wow, that's the cool. Mold will never grow. You'll never get condensation, even in a home with poorly insulated walls, uh, aluminum frame, single pane windows. All of that can go away with just proper ventilation. Interesting. That that's crazy. That's cool. Okay, so, right. so take us through this one. What what is this? Is this also condensation caused? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Put this as a quiz okay. to our audience here. Now, what is the clue that this is from condensation or from flooding? If you look carefully, there is something in this photo that conclusively tells us that it's one or the other. This is really important when we're trying to diagnose issues, uh, again, back to the summer months, where a moisture meter is not going to be helpful. Right. Because it hasn't flooded, it has, you don't have humidity issues. Thermal imaging cameras are good, but they're not always conclusive. Right. So we need to find other clues. Well, I mean, based on my understanding, it would look like maybe condensation because of the speckling, but that, I guess, isn't the best guarantee in this case, right? Yeah, that's very common to look toward the growth pattern and yeah. the speckling. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, it's not reliable. So even though it, it looks like a good indication, we got to set it aside and look for something else. Okay. In this case, the evidence is the uh, outlet socket. Oh, really? The mold growth is occurring on the plastic itself, which is surprising to a lot of people that it'll grow on there. Hmm. But if this was from flooding, from liquid water absorbing up to the sheetrock, there's no way it would uh, go on the outlet. Right? Capillary action can't go through solid plastic surfaces. Got it. So there'd be no way for the water to get on that plastic and saturate it. Humidity condensation absolutely can occur. It'll, it'll condense on any surface on an exterior wall. It happens to be cold. So okay. that, that's our evidence in this shot that it is from humidity and condensation and not from a flooding event. So if it was a flooding event, like you said, it would have to have actually, the water would have had to pass over that outlet to be able to have, grow more. Exactly. And in that case, it would have dried quick enough that you wouldn't have more okay. growth because okay. it takes repeated exposure. Got so it. if this was from flooding, I'd expect to see mold on the sheetrock and on the base trim, but the outlet would be totally clean. There Got wouldn't it. be any mold on it because it couldn't wick over. Got it. Okay. Fair enough. On to the next one. Oh, this must be in a bathroom, huh? This is a bathroom. <laughs> this is kind of a worst case scenario, but it, but it illustrates that point of no matter how bad this mold growth can get, it always occurs on the warm side of the wall. Mm. Right? So if we were to crawl into the attic and look on the back side of uh, this sheetrock, it would be perfectly clear. Mm. Now, that's a good way to test it, right? Once you've done a lot of these, you can look at it at a glance and say, this is obviously from humidity and condensation. But if we really want proof, go into the attic, pull back the insulation, look on the top side of that sheetrock. If it's clear and free of mold, no water staining, well, now we know. This is from humidity and condensation. If there was any mold on the top side, any water at all, then we would know it was absolutely a roof leak hmm. because there's no way the humidity will pass through that sheetrock and cause it to condense Got it. on that. Makes sense. Now the, the cause is pretty clear here. We've got a very old uh, exhaust fan clogged, probably hasn't been used or is non-functioning, so there's no way to get rid of that humidity. 
uh, when the shower is used. Okay. So like installing a new fan might be the solution in this situation. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. A new fan would solve this. This is pretty heavy mold growth, so it needs very specific cleaning procedures. Uh, also, what I see is that if a bathroom has this bad of mold, then usually the humidity throughout the whole house has been high. So the carpets, the upholstered furniture, a lot of things are likely impacted as well mm. because to get this kind of humidity in a bathroom means that humidity didn't just stop right there. Right. That over the years, it, it's been affecting the entire home and likely causing the, issues. Other, in other areas. In other the areas of the home. Yeah. yeah. And the bath fans on the opposite side, um, if they fail, the humidity will affect the whole house. If they're working, the upside is they will also impact the whole house in a positive way. Mm. They will do a, a good job of creating ventilation throughout the whole home, not just the little bathroom. Oh, really? Yeah, it'll pull air from the adjacent rooms, hallways, and drop that humidity. Mm. Now, will it reach deep into a closet, a master <laughs> bedroom, and a 1950s house with no insulation? Well, you probably still want to keep your items off exterior walls, keep that closet door cracked if it's an older home without insulation. But the bath fan will take care of the rest. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Let's go to the next one. Okay, yeah, tell us a little bit about this window here. And, and I, I would imagine that a mold close to window seals are probably, it's probably pretty common. Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. And again, uh, the photos here are going to highlight the absolute worst case scenario. Sure, sure. Uh, but we do see a lot of confusion, and I see a lot of money misspent on windows. Uh, I see a lot of windows replaced throughout a whole house under the belief that they are leaking or failing. Windows don't fail in mass. Sure, you can get one failure, maybe sure, two. Sure. But if you have moisture accumulating on windows throughout your whole home, it is not a leak or a flashing failure or window failure. You have a humidity condensation issue. Wow. The other good clue uh, is to look on what side of the house is it happening. Right? If it's happening primarily on the north side of the home, where you don't get any winter sun and winter warmth, mm -hmm. that's good evidence that you have condensation. Mm. Uh, I find also most houses have a window that has a big overhang over it, so it never gets any rain. Or just the way the wind tends to flow uh, in your house, around your house, when you get wind-driven rain, is there a side of your home that never receives that? Probably. Mm. If that has water around it, well then now we know it's not from because the rain never hits that window. It's from condensation. Hmm. Interesting. And when it happens on, on a vinyl window, double pane, we know the house has a really big problem. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because if it's aluminum, it, it would probably be a little bit more of a guess. But with vinyl windows and double pane, it's probably going to be condensation most, most right. often times. Right? right. So here you've got an example of the pooling that it can occur on the sill beneath the window. Hmm. Uh, is time goes by and that condensation slowly drips down, it can impact it. In a really bad scenario, it'll rot out the framing beneath the window. Wow. Uh, that typically happens with older metal frame windows, single pane where you get really heavy condensation. Hmm. Once or twice a month or throughout the winter, not going to cause that kind of rot. But if you have condensation on your windows basically daily throughout the winter months, well, that water's got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's often going down into the wall cavity beneath it and slowly rotting out that framing. So it's, it's worth fixing. It's, it's more than just a nuisance of condensation. It can be a, a structural integrity issue. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. All right, let's go to the next one. So this must be some of the uh, equipment that you used that we were talking about. Is that right? Yeah. This uh, scanner on the left is shooting the temperature. And on the, on the right, we're measuring the dew point. So the dew point is the temperature at which the air reaches 100% saturation. It can hold no more water. The water's got to go somewhere. So it's, now it starts condensing out on that surface. Mm. That's what we see water droplets on our lawn in the morning or on our car. That's that condensation occurring because at some point in that early morning, in those early morning hours, the dew point temperature was reached. Okay. So in this case, the window frame is 61.8 degrees. And the dew points over on the other screen where it says DP is uh, 63.1 degrees. Mm. So the window, even though it's only a couple of degrees cooler than the dew point, it doesn't matter. Once you're below the dew point, condensation will absolutely occur. Right. Okay. So, so one question that I want to bring up, because I think this might be right, but correct me if I'm wrong, 
is that's why in warmer climates, why humidity can be so much higher without water vapor turning into condensation because warmer air can hold more moisture. But as you go lower in temperature in air, the less moisture it can hold, right? So that means the dew point usually is a lower temperature than maybe outside or maybe like a warmer climate. Is that right? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And that's why we see issues with uh, cold surfaces. So water, air can hold a given amount of moisture at a certain temperature. If you increase the temperature, the size of the air, the volume expands. But the amount of water doesn't change at all. It stays at a static size. So if you increase the temperature in a home, 10 degrees, or a climate, again, back to the Florida example, the air is so warm that the capacity for moisture is far higher. Mm. That's why you'll feel it. Uh, you'll feel that humidity much more. We can have 100% humidity or say 90% humidity on a cold day in January here and nobody's walking around saying, oh my gosh, it feels so humid. Mm. Because the absolute quantity of moisture in the air is still fairly low compared to Florida yeah. where it's 90 and the absolute quantity is very high. I see. So we care about relative mm. humidity much more than absolute because what we care about is condensation. Right. We're not talking comfort now. We're talking... When is it likely to condense out on a surface? Got it. In a home, the windows are usually first because the R value is a lot less, the insulation, than the adjacent walls. And then you go back to that very first example where we had mold in the closet on the ceiling or on the exterior edge. Well, that's because the insulation had been pulled back. Hmm. So it was a cold spot. That 10, 15 degrees Kohler was enough to drop it below that dew point. And then you get that condensation and mold growth. Got it. Makes sense. All right. So this must be what you would install in that bathroom picture that we saw to fix the problem, right? Right. You know, a, a good bath fan will solve a lot of problems in our climate. We really prefer the constant flow units, the Panasonic Whisper Green, something mm -hmm. like that. They basically run 24-7 at a low speed, mm -hmm. nice and quiet, so people don't turn them off. What I find in a lot of homes, especially ones in the 90s and 2000s that have those central fans in the laundry room mm -hmm. with the uh, timer switches, mm -hmm. that they're almost never running, oh. right? Because customers are annoyed by the sound, so they pull the pins, and the whole purpose of it's defeated. Uh -huh. So for ventilation to work, you got to use it. And what I find is it needs to be quiet or people will, will turn it off. Got it. So these run constantly at a, you can set the speed, but basically half speed. And then when the bathroom is being used, they ramp up to full speed oh, when you really need to evacuate that, that excess moisture. Hmm. Now, if you were to build a house today, uh, a lot of people don't understand this, but say a 2,000 square foot home today, uh, to meet modern airflow codes, you would have to have one of these running at half speed 24-7, 100% of the time. So when we talk about, oh, running your bath fan for 10, 15 minutes after a shower or something like that, that's not nearly enough wow. to meet our ventilation. Now, a lot of that's because we're building houses much tighter than we used to. So if you've got an old uh, 1930s home that leaks like a sieve, you ironically need a lot less ventilation <laughs> because you have natural ventilation. The house is just breathing that much better. Mm. But I see a lot of problems where people take old homes and then they go air seal them. They get a new window tighter. They get the siding replaced. When they do that, they seal all the air holes. So the house becomes much tighter. The insulation gets replaced. Mm. All those penetrations are foamed and sealed. So this old house that used to have pretty good natural ventilation, not good from an energy efficiency standpoint, but good from an air quality. Well, now it's all buttoned up tight, but they still have their 1950s fans in the bathroom. <laughs> and you have really severe condensation and mold problems. Interesting. So take note, flippers, who uh, fix and flip properties. Make sure you're listening to this. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's cheap insurance. I also really love these for landlord-tenant situations. They're great for rentals. Uh, there can be disputes over who, if you're running the bath fan enough or not enough, energy usage. These set it and automate it and take it out of the user's control, and they just they run without any user input. So they're a great way to... Uh, to get the ventilation you need without questions of energy efficiency. Turning it on and energy. Exactly. Cool. That's awesome. That's a Panasonic, is that what you said? It's a Panasonic Whisper Green. Whisper Green. Yep. Cool. They have a ton of different types, but anything in that uh, Whisper Green category will give you that constant ventilation at that low speed and then the ramp up to high speed. Nice. That's awesome. Good to know. 
And then this, this kind of walks us through like different temperatures with the fans. Is that, is that right? Yeah, this goes back to what we mentioned a few minutes ago where we talked about the benefit of bringing in cold, wet air. So you see on this graph, here's a typical day in Seattle in, uh, in the winter. 40 degrees, 100% humidity, 2.39. So we take this air, we bring it inside the home, and we heat it up to 68 degrees. Hmm. Now the humidity drops all the way from 100% way down to 35. You can see in the blue numbers wow. there. Mold growth will never happen. Wow. You could have old single pane windows, really poorly insulated walls, and still eliminate all the condensation and mold if you have sufficient ventilation. Hmm. Now, energy efficiency wise, you still may want to take steps to replace those windows and insulate your walls. But in the meantime, ventilation will solve a whole host of, of issues when it comes to humidity based mold in our climate. Nice. So basically, um, what, is there a certain level of humidity in the air? And this probably depends on the situation, but that mold won't really grow below or is there like a certain number? Yeah, it's a great question. So we shoot for uh, under 50%. Okay. If you want to give yourself a healthy margin, I like 45%. So you can get a cheap relative humidity gauge, mount it on your wall near your thermostat, something like that, and just monitor it. Hmm. All we care about is the winter. If it goes above that in the summer, it's not going to cause a problem, and there's also nothing you can do about it. It's just a humid <laughs> summer day. Yeah. In the winter, we want to make sure it doesn't go above those numbers. Okay. Now, the newer the home, the higher you can go. If you've really? got a, a nice new home with two by six walls, a lot of insulation, modern windows, then you could probably get up, get by with up to 50, 55% humidity hmm. because the dew point's never going to be reached because your walls are nicely insulated and your windows have a high R value. I see. Scale that back to a the other side, a really poorly insulated home uh, or a basement, something like this, then I want even lower humidity because we need more margin for that dew point that's going to occur. We need to start okay. with really dry air so when it hits that old single pane window, there's not enough moisture to condense out even if it's got a very low R value to it. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So as far as like humidity count or the number um, for the humid air and stuff like that and temperature, take us through like what it would be like for a basement. So that's what it looks like. This is on the slide. Sure. So basements have a lot of issues. And what I find is that a huge amount of that time it's from humidity and condensation. We've all walked into a basement and smelled that musty odor. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I mean, basements can flood for sure. But a lot of that's due to uh, elevated humidity. And this will show you why. Mm. So you take a house at 68 degrees and 35% humidity. Nice dry air, no mold growth, no musty odor, no condensation. Now, you want to save some money, so you shut the heat off to the basement, and it cools all the way down to 55 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look what happens to the humidity. It goes from 35% in the blue in the middle, way up to 55%. Mm. Now, that's just in the middle of the basement. The walls of the basement are going to be a lot colder, concrete wall, yeah. the windows, so that temp is going to go down to 50, 45. Well, now you're in the zone, if the humidity is at 65, 70%, that's when mold starts growing. Mm -hmm. Carpet, upholstery, you know, books, you pull the backpack out of the basement that sat there all winter and it's got that musty odor. Nine times out of ten, it's due to insufficient heat in that basement. Wow. The good news is that the answer is pretty simple. Crank the heat up. Mm. Much like the upstairs, we also want to see some ventilation. The ventilation won't really do any good unless we also have heat mm. with it. We need to bring that fresh air in and then heat it up. Got it. Now, there's always a balance between the energy cost of that heat and the goal of reducing mold and condensation. Right. Uh, so with a basement that is just raw concrete and very poorly insulated, you're going to spend a fair bit of money insulating it. So that's a conversation we always have of, okay, can you relegate items to the basement that uh, mold won't affect? You're storing your garden tools down there, but if you're going to put soft goods, clothing, bedding, stuff like that, then you need to treat it like you would the rest of your house and right. keep that heat at a reasonable level. Okay, so basically most often times there's an issue with um, basements not being warm enough is and mold growing is probably because they're an older basement that hasn't been insulated as well? Yes, yes. And also, we still see it even with modern basements where you get a lot of vapor coming up uh, through the concrete. Mm. 
in the very one of the very first slides we showed where there was the, the basement with a little area rug mm -hmm. vapor coming up through that can happen even in a modern home Wow so we really uh, we really need to find the source of it is it from humidity and condensation coming through the concrete or is it just from poor temperature okay so so concrete floors can breathe right I mean they or moisture can come up through them is what you're saying yeah concrete can pass a surprising amount of water through it Wow now, a lot depends on how it was sealed uh, how it cured. The cure time tremendously affects how open the pores are in the concrete, mm. which, which affects how much water can pass through it. In an older home, maybe they didn't put a vapor barrier down, or over the decades it's degraded so water can get through. I also see a lot of issues where people convert a garage into a living space. Yeah, I see right? that a lot. It was a garage, so nobody, planned, nobody put a vapor barrier down. Nobody was thinking of it as a living space. Well, now you put carpet over the top. That slows the moisture down. Condensation, from condensation the occurs, you get mold growth. Hmm. So the lever we can pull here in most cases is the temperature and what we care about is the humidity. Some basements, you might be able to keep it 55 degrees and the, humidity, warm and the humidity never goes above 45 because uh. you're on a really dry lot. Uh, a few houses down, maybe a spring runs adjacent to their, to their basement and you've got to keep it at 68 degrees just to keep it uh, below 50%. So it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's unique to that house. Got so it. that's why you need to measure the humidity and then toggle your heat up or down to keep it below a certain level. Got right? it. You want to keep it as cool as possible for energy and, and the cost of heating while maintaining humidity below a certain point. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So take us through what's going on in this slide. It, it looks like there's mold growing on the back side of the wall. Yeah. This is from a basement. Half the sheetrock's been torn off. So it's a divider wall in between two rooms, not an exterior wall. And during some demolition, mold growth was discovered inside of the wall cavity. Hmm. So here's the question. Is this from condensation or something like a, a flooding event, liquid water? Hmm. Well, it seems like, I mean, again, we can't really go by just the pattern, but um, I don't know. What, you, tell, you tell us. Sure. Well, I hear a lot of different answers. So what I typically hear are, are two answers, and they're both contradictory, which points to the confusion behind this. Huh. I hear people say, well, look at this speckled pattern. It's pretty light. It's not super intense. So it must be from condensation. Flooding wouldn't do that. Flooding would make a, a more clear line. OK, that's logical. I also hear people say, yeah, but look at where the line stops. The mold growth actually stops at a pretty clear spot and mm -hmm. doesn't go anywhere above it. That's yeah, true. it's speckled but there's a pretty clear stopping point, yeah. so it must be from flooding. Well, that points to why we cannot use the growth pattern to determine what caused it. Hmm. This is all from flooding. Now there's uh, incontrovertible proof of this just from the photo. You don't even need to go to the job site to know that this is from flooding. Wow. We know it's flooding because it happened inside of a wall cavity, right? Okay. That's Condensation right. never occurs inside of a wall cavity. Hmm. It's always going to occur on just the side the warm side of that wall right. facing the room. The other uh, evidence is that it's a divider wall inside of a inside the house. It's not on an exterior wall. Well, you can't get condensation on an interior wall because the temperature is the same on both sides. Okay, yeah, that right? makes sense. It only is going to occur on an exterior wall. Wow. So we know from just this glance that this house floods. Hmm. Now we, I wouldn't go tearing off this large piece of sheetrock uh, just to prove that. <laughs> now the customer's got a lot of repair work ahead of them. So I'm, let me show you another technique of how we figure this out in, in the field. Okay. All right, different home. This is a basement. Customer noticed a musty odor and called us out. So if you look at the base trim, there is no mold growth on the side facing the room. But if you pull back the base, you can see there's mold behind it on the wall. And there's also mold on the back side of the base itself. Hmm. In the, uh, the other photo, you, we pulled back the carpet and looked at the tack strip. Really heavy mold growth there as well. Now, same question. Is this from condensation and humidity or from a flooding event, some sort of liquid water intrusion? This one trips uh, a lot of people up, and the consequences are huge, right? Yeah. If you're about to buy a home and you think it's from condensation, and three months later there's three inches of water in your basement, you are going to be very unhappy. Yeah. You know, the cost of these repairs are pretty large. So it's really important to figure out if it's from humidity 
and condensation or liquid water. Mm -hmm. Now the proof here is that the mold is growing behind the base, on the back side. Humidity would never do that. Humidity can't reach behind the base and start growing behind it. It's going to only grow on that, what we call first condensing surface, mm -hmm. the side of the wall facing you. Well, the base is nailed to the wall and caulked against it, so it's basically the wall mm -hmm. in that sense. So it's a flooding event, basically. This is all from flooding. Now, the other clue is the tax strip, right? You, it, pull back the carpet in a corner, look at the tax strip. Is it black, degraded, rusty? Pretty good evidence that this area floods periodically. Makes sense. Now, it doesn't tell us if this was three months ago or 12 years ago, right? Uh, the mold will look the same with time. Hmm. So perhaps even the flooding problem was fixed after this happened. And oh. okay, when was a sump pump installed? Was it after the last event and there's been no future issues? Yeah, okay. So none of these are inherently walkaways or deal breakers, but they're really important clues. And now we need to piece together the timeline. Right see if it's been solved. Sure, it makes sense. Cool. And then what, what are you doing here in this picture? Well, this is a confusing one on the other end of the spectrum. So this is a moisture okay. meter measuring the sheetrock. It's showing fairly dry on the wall, but the uh, carpet and the pad was saturated. Wow. Very wet. Pull back the carpet and the tack strip is saturated as well. Uh, you can visually look at it and see that it's been degrading over time. It's, it's been painted white. It looks like somebody put some kills on it to try to hide the problem at some point. Uh, but clearly it's, it's rotten and destroyed. So it all looks like it would be from a flooding event. Exactly. Right? Yeah, all the evidence points to flooding here. And in nine times out of 10, it would be flooding. We took some measurements in this one and, and there's some really surprising numbers. So first look at the humidity over there, 100%. Wow. That's hard to do, right? Yeah. And this felt yeah. like you were walking into a humidor. I mean, it, it wow. felt very humid. Uh, you could even see there's water condensing on our meters in the photo, <laughs> uh, which again points to very high humidity. Now this number here, 1896, that's the CO2. So oh. CO2 is a, a measurement of the airflow in a house by measuring uh, the air that humans exhaust. So outside air has a static level of CO2. When people are inside of a home breathing, well, their air spikes the CO2 and it goes up. So if you've got a bunch of people in a small house that's really tightly sealed, the number will go way high. Mm. If you have a really well ventilated home, it'll stay low no matter what because it's exhausting it. So it gives us a sense of how well a house is ventilated based on the amount of people here. Mm. Now in this inspection, it was just the inspector and one other person and it was at almost 2,000, which is really high. Wow. So that, combined with the humidity, tells us this is a very tightly sealed house that has no ventilation whatsoever, and it's causing the humidity to spike very high. So this, although it looks like a uh, leak from water, it's all from condensation. Wow, that's crazy. Now, here's the even crazier part about this. This homeowner had a bid for $16,000 to repair the water leak in the concrete slab beneath this carpet. She had a crack across the slab, a company came out and said, well clearly uh, water's coming up through this crack and saturating it, $16,000 bid to repair all that. It would have done absolutely nothing. Oh. It would not have fixed a Jeez. single thing. So that's why it's so important to get to the source before we throw money at it. We gotta know really what's causing the moisture issue in the first place. Wow, so I mean you, the contractor didn't even know what the problem was, apparently. No, no. Crazy. And it's easy to be fooled. You know, I, I, I don't terribly blame them in this case because it was odd, but there should be a clue when you walk into a house and it's at 100% humidity. Yeah. That something's off here wow. and additional investigation is, is necessary. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so now we're getting into, it looks like attic space. This looks pretty bad. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about attic space as it relates to mold and ventilation? Sure. So attic mold can have a really surprising look to it. This is uh, pretty typical. It almost looks like soot, mm. like it's been burned. I've yeah. even seen home inspection reports where they call it out as uh, evidence of a past fire. <laughs> uh, I get wow. it though, it, it really looks it does, like it. It does, I mean it does. Often there's no fuzziness to it. It's just a black, flat, uh, almost looks like it's been painted black, but it's definitely mold. Yeah, the only thing that would 
in my mind, make it rule out fire is the fact that like the joists themselves don't have any, don't appear to have anything on it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, interesting. Here is the other end of the spectrum where we do see kind of the white fuzzy mold. There's no difference in uh, health issues here or structural integrity. It's just uh, many of these times the exact same type of mold can show up in different colors. Oh, interesting. So you can't even look at a mold and say, well, it's white, so it's X, Y, and Z. Now, some molds only show up in a certain color. Mm. Sacubotrys is always black. Mm. So if it's white, we know that's not Sacubotrys. Mm. In an attic, we really don't care, though. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be cleaned up. And we need to make sure it doesn't come back. The type mm. of mold is not going to affect the remediation protocol whatsoever. Mm. So it's not even worth testing it because it's not the results won't change anything. Put that money toward fixing the problem. Hmm. Now, on a really cold day, you can even get frost from that condensation. So wow. this really shows us what happens in the Frost winter. on the inside. The That's crazy. Hot, humid air comes up from the house, hits the cold sheathing. Now, throughout a normal winter, that's going to cause condensation, and it'll look wet. It can even look like it's dripping. On a really cold stretch, it will freeze, and you wow. can see uh, it's turned to frost. Wow. inside of this attic. So that would eventually become mold after it, it melts? Yes, eventually. absolutely. And this attic, particularly behind that white frost, the sheathing is covered in mold. Oh. Right, because any attic that has this intense of condensation is going to have a mold problem. Hmm. Now, wow. where I see a lot of confusion, especially in the winter months, is when you have uh, this heavy of condensation on an attic. Right, home inspectors, contractors, they're used to seeing um, standard roof leaks, say, in a localized area near some flashing, something like that, and they know how to interpret that. Okay, we got to go fix this on the rough, stop the leak. When water is seen throughout the whole sheathing, it really throws people off. Hmm. This is where I see recommendations for a full uh, roof replacement. I'll hear comments like, well, systemic failure, water intrusion throughout the whole roof. Now, intuitively, that we should pause when we hear that. Mm. Is it really likely that a roof is failing at 50 different places yeah. at the exact same time, and yet there's also no evidence of it dripping through the sheetrock? Very unlikely, yeah. right? One right. or two leaks, maybe. The other proof that it's from condensation and not from a roof leak is if it's heavier on the north side, right? Sun never hits it in the winter. Right. Uh, most most of the time, the mold is much worse on that north side of the attic, where you're getting that colder surface. Okay, so take us through this this photo here, because it looks like um, the ventilation, or it looks like the there's no mold growing or anything, and I, I don't see any problems with it. Can you can you tell us what we're looking at here? Sure. This is a curious case. So uh, you're absolutely right. There's no mold growth anywhere, but look at something else that's weird. There's no ventilation. No ventilation in the soffits, no ridge vent, no RVOs, completely sealed up attic, and yet no mold growth. Now, intuitively, we would think if you have an attic without ventilation, you are definitely going to have a mold problem, mm. yet there's no issue. So let's look at another attic that will help illuminate this point. Totally different house. Perfect soffit venting in every single bay. You've got bird block venting, allowing fresh air to come in. You've got RVO vents. Uh, throughout the top, allowing good venting, but there's mold growth on the sheathing. Why? Well, the answer is in the insulation. Mm. You can even see there's the kind of measurement tape there showing uh -huh. how much insulation was blown in. And we've got thick R49 modern insulation. All things being equal, the more insulation you have in an attic, the more likely you are to have mold on the roof sheathing. Mm. Super counterintuitive, but we'll go back to this photo and I'll show you why. Look how little insulation there is. It's barely covering the rafters. Four, five, maybe six inches of insulation tops. In the old days, we didn't plan on it, but a fair bit of heat radiated up through the insulation, made it all the way to the roof sheathing, and kept condensation from occurring. Doesn't matter how cold it is outside, enough heat escaped up to warm the sheathing that it never hit that dew point we talked about earlier. Mm. So condensation never happened. No condensation, no mold growth. Now you take a modern house and add all that insulation and the roof sheathing stays ice cold. So no heat makes it up, but moisture makes it through, 
condensation occurs and you have a mold issue. Wow. Even with those vents. Even with the vents. Wow. Now, one of the questions I often get is, well, wait, how is moisture making it up into the attic in the first place? Well, insulation stops radiant heat loss. That's its purpose. But it does almost nothing to stop airflow. And moisture is transported most effectively through airflow. Mm. So the, the moisture that causes condensation on the roof sheathing has come straight through that insulation. It's coming through the penetrations in the ceiling. Anywhere you've got an electrical wire coming through a ceiling, uh, you have a hole, right? And that hole allows air to come from the main part of the house right up into the attic. And as that air is moving up, it's bringing humidity and moisture with it. Hmm. The insulation, uh, ironically, uh, is the worst of both worlds. The fiberglass does nothing to stop the water from coming up, the vapor into the attic, but it effectively stops the heat. Wow. In an old house, the vapor came up, sure, but so did the heat. So it kind of balanced each other out. I see. New houses, all the vapor comes up, very little heat. Interesting. So if you're looking at maybe an older house that is, you're looking at updating the insulation because you want better energy efficiency from a cost perspective, uh, you could possibly be doing yourself a disservice if you had older inflation, um, older insulation that was allowing radiant heat to come up, right? If you don't fix the problem with absolutely that's with, spot on. with ceiling, right? Is that what it would be? Yes, with, with ceiling. Air, ceiling. air ceiling. Yeah, a new house is is required by code to have air sealing. You have to spray foam all the little electrical penetrations to stop that from coming up. In an older home, certainly not. So the worst case scenario I see is a house like this where the uh, homeowner says, you know what, I want to do the right thing. I want to improve the energy efficiency of my home, lower my energy bills, so I'm going to call up an insulation contractor and we're going to come blow in a bunch of insulation. Well, unless they air seal all those penetrations, now you've created the worst of both worlds. Mm. You've dramatically cooled your roof sheathing, but you haven't done anything to stop the vapor from coming up through. Wow. Now, That's this is one of those weird things where the code is probably going to make the problem worse before it makes it better, right? Mm -hmm. Every few years, the required R value of attic insulation goes up. And as that continues to go up, the roof is going to stay get colder and colder and cause more and more problems. You know, I've talked to code officials about this, and there doesn't really seem to be an awareness yet of kind of the end result of this issue. So it's something homeowners really need to be diligent about. Uh, what I tell them is, look, before you insulate, make sure your house can handle it. Hmm. Make sure you air seal. Absolutely do not add insulation unless you also have a contractor go through and air seal all the penetrations. And also just be aware of how the rest of the house is interacting. If you've got a big, tall evergreen tree, shading the south side of the roof so your roof never really gets any sun in the winter well these kind of issues are going to be a lot worse mm. you need that winter sun if you've got a well ventilated home and it gets a lot of winter sun on the roof and good ventilation well then you can probably get by with adding the insulation without causing a problem mm. the code isn't going to tell you these sort of things right it's not going to talk about a right. tree absolutely and shading so we need to look at it as a system and then make a judgment on how much insulation can this roof handle. Interesting. So each property can be unique. Very unique. Yep. Yeah. Even neighbor to neighbor because, you know, you got the big cedar tree shading it and your neighbor doesn't. That could be the difference between mold and no mold. Okay. Can you go back to what you were talking about in terms of R value, what that means? Is that relative humidity or what is that? No. R value is a measurement of uh, the insula insulation value of a material. Oh, okay. So like a window has a specific R value rating. Uh, insulation has an R value per inch. So like spray foam insulation is say R5 or 6 per inch. So it's a much higher insulation value than fiberglass. Mm. So 5 inches of spray foam or rigid foam is the equivalent of maybe 30 inches of fiberglass. And that R value is what gives us the measurement. So the code it doesn't require um, a certain amount of inches of insulation. It requires an R value. I see. So if you have to hit R49 in your attic, well, that equates to X inches of fiberglass, maybe a few inches less of dense packed cellulose. And if you were foaming it in a flat rough, you know, way fewer inches. Okay. The R value is the measurement tool.
So is there certain types of insulation that prohibit um, airflow or moisture from going up through your ceiling and into the attic? Yeah, so fiberglass is the worst from an airflow standpoint. Okay. Air goes right through it. Uh, dense pack cellulose, or cellulose, blown in cellulose, works really well. Mm. If you get enough of it, it effectively acts as, a, as an air barrier where it will uh, nearly eliminate the flow of air through it. And if you feel it, you can tell it's really dense. Mm. Uh, it feels much denser. It's a little bit more expensive than fiberglass, but not prohibitively so. And most contractors don't use it less from a cost standpoint, but it's, it's a little bit less pleasant to work with. Mm. Uh, but the performance of it is way better wow. than fiberglass. So it's worth the it's definitely worth the extra oh, 15, 20% premium you'll pay over fiberglass mm. to use it. Wow, interesting. That's good to know. Okay, so tell us what we got here. So here's an example of that airflow. There's a skylight. Uh, skylights leak, for sure. Uh, flashing all around them. It's pretty common to have a water issue. But this has nothing to do with a leak. This is all airflow from inside the house, mm. right? Uh, often we see skylights in bathrooms, which uh, is that perfect mix of hot, humid air and a very leaky point. Mm. Hot, humid air flows up the cavity uh, in the skylight and then makes its way up into the attic and condenses out. That's where you see this black and white mold growth mm. occurring. As soon as it escapes the hot air of the uh, bathroom, and cools down, it hits that dew point, condensation occurs, and you get mold growth. Interesting. So this and this could be a situation where somebody, an inspector, diagnoses this wrong because he thinks that it, it's not condensation? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this would often get called out as a flashing failure, come and replace the uh, the skylight. You know, these are pretty wow. big ticket items. Yeah. You know, that, that's more than a few hundred bucks to have somebody come out and replace the skylight. Uh, and often that can tip into, well, your roof's a little bit older, we, you know, let's just do the whole thing. And $15,000 later, yeah. Yeah. you have a new yeah. roof, which is nice, but it empty wasn't wallet. necessary. <laughs> and yeah. an empty wall. Exactly. Wow. Here's another example. Uh, it, it looks like it's spraying mold, right? Yeah. What this is is a, an abandoned conduit line. It's okay. going to be used for electrical wires or something like that. And it is basically providing an air connection from inside the home up into the attic. Mm. So hot air, or humid air more appropriately, from your house is flowing up into, this, into the attic through the conduit. And as soon as that humid air hits the cold attic, this is a gable wall in this case, it condenses out and causes mold. Mm. Now, rarely we get this kind of smoking gun that, yeah. that illustrates it so perfectly. But the same principle is what causes 95% of attic mold in the first place. It's just systemic throughout the whole attic. Instead of one uh, random conduit line showing it, right. it's hundreds of hidden penetrations and holes, uh, each allowing their own small amount of water vapor up okay. into the attic space. So that's why new construction now has to be sealed off. Exactly. It's stopping this and all the other holes. OK. Good to know. Wow. Which can be done retroactively pretty inexpensively. Uh, especially if you're replacing the insulation already, say you had a pest control issue in there, or something like that, it's getting pulled out, definitely that's the time to get your attic air sealed. It doesn't cost that much and it will greatly reduce the incidence of condensation. Nice, that's good to know. Okay, so tell us what this is. It looks like a hood vent, is that, is that right? Yeah, this is a ridge vent. This ridge is vent. a externally baffled ridge vent. So there are two types of ridge vents. You have internally baffled right here, and it looks like corrugated cardboard, but made out of plastic. You've got these really tight baffles. The problem is the baffles are so tight that the air uh, does not flow very efficiently through it. So in an attic, what causes air to move is a stack effect. Warm air rises, and it slowly pulls air from the soffits and moves up and heads out the ridge vent or upper roof vents. Well, this air movement is very slow. Right? It's not like a wind type of air speed. Right. It's very slow. So any little restriction is going to dramatically reduce or even stop that airflow. Mm. What we find is it's not all the time, but internally baffled ridge vents can be a strong uh, cause of mold growth because they stop or slow down that ventilation. Mm. Now, how this plays out in a typical scenario is something like this. Uh, Inspector goes up into an attic in the winter, they see condensation, water 
the amount I call condensation. Let's see water covering the underside of the rough sheathing. Roofer gets called out and say, well, uh, you got good ventilation, you got a ridge vent, you got soft vents. With all this water, there must be something else. The roof must be failing. Here's your bid for $20,000. Let's get you a new roof. Well, what we know now is that internally baffled ridge vents are not, are not actually doing their job. Wow. So that's the cause. And instead of a whole new roof, you replace your ridge vent with an externally baffled model, your problem goes away. Wow. So it's really key information to make sure we're spending money on the right solution. Absolutely. It's a lot of difference in price right there. Huge difference. That's if, crazy. If you're getting a new roof put on, just for uh, you know the reason that it's worn out, it's aged, not out of any specific condensation issue, it's still always worth getting an externally baffled ridge vent. Mm. So it's, the other one, the internally baffled, that one, um, that one is actually meets, still meets building code? Uh, it still meets, some of them still meet building code and they just don't meet reality, right? <laughs> there are a lot Nature. of cases where people complain about building code being excessive, yeah. and I get it, and there are cases where building code seems insufficient, and this is one of those, mm. where houses, building code wasn't really, uh, roof ventilation has not been updated to handle the increased burden of a really tight house. If you have a really tight house, which modern construction requires, your yeah. air sealing around your top plates, your bottom plates, the house itself is really sealed, well, now that humidity has nowhere to go but up. So homeowners turn off their bath fan, their exhaust fans. Now we've actually put a lot more humidity into an attic than we used to. So we need even better ventilation than before. Mm. So better roofers know this and will only install externally baffled ridge vents. So mm. it's a good litmus test of, am I dealing with a quality roofer? Right. If they're selling me an internally baffled one, probably not. Interesting. If they're, if they're assuming and, and only installing externally baffled, it probably means they've been uh, bit before <laughs> by condensation issues and they're doing the right thing and saying, let's get a well venting ridge vent installed. Huh. Interesting. It's good to know. Okay, wow, this looks terrible. So take us through what happened here. So this is a flat roof. Uh, obviously, it's got intense damage. The sheathing, you could just pick up and pull it off with your hand. The rafters uh, were actually rotted out. The top inch or two were heavily degraded. Uh, now, a lot of people think flat roofs are bad in Seattle because, well, it rains. Sure. You know, it's likely to leak. But that's not the case. You can certainly build a waterproof flat roof membrane, uh, and it can last for decades without leaking. What people don't think about is the other side, condensation. This, this damage here, as bad as, as it is, this is all from humidity and condensation. Wow. How no old leak. is this roof? This, this, roughly, this roof is about six, seven years old. Oh my goodness. Right, so it should last 20, 30 or more years, not six, seven. Sure. Uh, the reason flat roofs fail at such a high rate is because of the way air moves in an attic. So ventilation in an attic depends upon an angle, the pitch of the roof. Okay. Air wants to go up, straight vertical. That's, it's called the stack effect. It means warm air rises, right? Sure. Well, in a normal attic that's got a pitch, sure, it can't, it can't go straight up, but it'll hit your roof and start moving out at an upward angle and go out your roof vents. What happens when you lower the angle of a roof to flat or really low, it doesn't matter how many vents you have on each side of the roof, the air has no motivation to move 50 horizontal feet and then go out. Mm. It's not going to move. It's going to stagnate and it'll just go up and stay there. And with it, the condensation will build up and build up and build up on the underside of the roof sheathing, eventually rotting out uh, your sheathing and the rafters. Wow. So the, the right way to do this is to put, is to eliminate all the ventilation. It's called a conditioned attic. You either put rigid foam on top, so you'd have your plywood, rigid foam, offset seams, and then your final waterproof membrane on top of that. Mm. Or if it's uh, certain homes, it's easier to do it from below. And you'd spray foam insulation on the underside of the sheathing and then string bats or another type of insulation from below. But the, the key point is that you're eliminating the ventilation and you're putting the insulation right on the sheathing. Just like you build a wall in a house, right? I see. So you're taking a wall and making it like uh, a ceiling or how you build a cathedral ceiling. There's no air gap there for ventilation. It's just all together. That lack of air gap and having the insulation right against the sheathing and it being spray foam or rigid foam, it stops condensation from occurring. 
Hmm. The dew point cannot be hit on the underside of that rough sheathing. You could go decades and you'll never have a condensation or a humidity problem. Wow. So tell us a little bit about this project when you went out there. Was uh, What were they planning on doing differently? Yeah, it's, it's a bit amazing, but the roofer is, I asked him what his plan was to do different, you know, expecting to hear something dramatic because roofs should not fail. The same roofer? It was the exact same roofer who was oh. hired the first time. Yikes. And not out of a warranty hire, oh. just hired to do it. Um, and he's putting it back the exact same way. Oh, okay. No changes, no improvements, it'll rot out. And I see that a lot, uh, that roofers, if, if your roof leaks, like, liquid water leak, flashing, dripping, and you call them up and say, hey, I got a roof leak, this thing's only five years old, come fix it. All right, they'll know what's on them if they messed up. If your roof rots out from condensation, because they messed up the ventilation, or right. it shouldn't have been vented in the first place, they'll say, I'm sorry, we don't deal with ventilation. That's oh my gosh, area. so they don't cover that? They don't, uh, which is, is not right, because they're the ones installing the vents. Right. So it would, it's, it's not a big logical leap to say they should be responsible for thinking through whether it's gonna work, but what I see in the industry is that there's very little responsibility taken there, and they'll put it back on the homeowner or building owner. So, in for homeowners, they need to. You really need to think this through yeah. on your own. You need to make sure you've either got a good roofer that you can trust in the beginning, or um, make sure they're building it in a way that's going to last a long time. Wow, that's crazy, amazing. Okay, so I think now we'd like to. Our audience would like to probably hear about the quiz that we had at the beginning of which scenario was actually more harmful to your health in terms of the uh, musty carpet in the basement versus the uh, townhome that actually had mold all throughout the walls. So now James is gonna take us through the scenario and kinda um, shed some light on the subject. Okay, so let's go back. This was the house with the mold inside the wall cavity, right? Right. Let's show you a few more photos. You can see the light, it's fairly light speckling but it was everywhere. Here's where a large wow. portion of sheetrock was removed. The cause of this was all course of construction. Really? When houses are built in our climate in the winter, they're inevitably rained on. Sure. The sheathing, the subfloor, everything gets, gets saturated. What happens is uh, the insulation contractor shows up and puts their hand on the sheathing and says, all right, it feels pretty dry. So they put the insulation on and the sheetrock, it wasn't dry. Uh, so over the next few weeks, all that moisture has nowhere to go and mold growth starts occurring. They've already sealed it up so there's no visual indication that it's happening. You really need to use a moisture meter before you put insulation. Mm -hmm. Your hand cannot assess the moisture content inside of that uh, sheathing. Wow. So we took a sample in this house and then we took a sample in this other one. This was that basement with this uh, really strong musty odor and a damp rug. The gray concrete, you can see it's from vapor coming up through. It hits the back side of the rug, that rubber backing, has nowhere to go, so it starts condensing out. Wow. No visible mold, but a pretty intense, musty smell. Let's look at the results here. So before we go over the results, so the, uh, the basement floor can actually, it's pretty porous, I guess. I guess water can tra travel through concrete, basically? Yeah, it's weird to think about, but concrete can be very porous. It depends on how it was cured originally. Um, depending on the cure time and the amount of water used, you can either have a very tight pore structure where little water will pass, or you can have a very open pore structure where you can get large volumes of water. Mm. A lot also depends on the quality of the vapor barrier. Uh, is it decades old and it's degraded? Or where I see a lot of issues is a garage that's been converted to a living room or a bedroom. It was never intended to be a living space, so there's no vapor barrier, yeah. there's no water mitigation, and that water can go right through it. Mm. Now, we're used to thinking in terms of basement and concrete slabs as you know, liquid water coming in, a flooded basement. I'm not, we're not talking about um, that, we're talking about vapor coming up through, mm -hmm. and when it hits the carpet, it slows down enough and causes mold growth. Mm. So if you've walked into a carpeted basement with a musty odor, uh, this is often the cause. Hmm. Without any carpet, the vapor just comes right up into the air. Your ventilation deals with it, and there's really no, no problem. Interesting. So the issue occurs when somebody buys a house in August. Concrete's dry, of course. Uh, and then in the fall, they finish out the basement. They put their pad down, carpet down. A few months later, they start noticing a musty odor. Well, it was operating just fine as bare concrete. 
now that you got carpet and a pad on, that moisture has nowhere to go and you start getting mold growth. Mm. So if it wasn't sealed correctly or had a uh, really great vapor barrier uh, to begin with, can you do that post fact? Like, can you Sealing seal it? it afterward usually does not work. Really? You have about a year after the concrete is poured before you uh, can't seal it anymore. Really? It develops a, uh, a hardening of the surface and the, and the pores close so your sealant can't penetrate the concrete. Oh, interesting. So you got to do it fresh, or you can shot blast it, sand blast it, okay. but as that sounds, that's not cheap. <laughs> right. uh, but you, you can, you remove the top layer of concrete and then it will absorb it. Mm. In most cases we say, eh, instead of putting your money towards sealing it, put it toward an interior footing drain uh, with a sump pump, and the goal is to reduce the water pressure below the slab. Got it. So, so the water's not trying to get in in the first place. Uh, that's a very reliable technique. Usually better than a French drain. French drain, you got to tear out decks and you know mature trees and shrubs you're destroying to get to the foundation. Right. So once a house is up and running, an interior footing drain is typically the way to go. Okay. So I'm sure they're really dying to find out what the results were of this one. So let's take a look at that. Actually, these are the results of the other one, right? Yep. So this okay. is the house with mold in all the wall cavities. Okay. Remember, it was in every every wall that was tested had that mold growth. Now, if we look at the total spore count uh, over there, 350, and on the other end of the screen, 440 at the very bottom. And the most common type that we're going to see cause an issue here is this Penicillium aspergillus at 160 and 320. Those are very low numbers. Hmm. Uh, that represents a, a very clean home. Even after re remediation and cleanup, you would be hard pressed to get a house any cleaner than that. Wow. So all that mold in the wall cavities had no impact on the indoor air quality. It makes sense when you think about it a little bit more because the sheetrock was acting as an encapsulant, right? Right. It was sealing in all those mold spores and there was no way for them to interact with the home. It also was an older issue. It had happened when the house was built three, four years prior but it wasn't wet anymore, it wasn't ongoing, so the spores were not being fed. They didn't have any conditions to keep growing. It was, uh, dead is probably not the right term, but dormant. And as unpleasant as it is to think about that lingering mold in the wall cavities, it wasn't causing any problems. Wow. Now, this is the sample from the basement with a wet carpet. Penicillium aspergillus at th uh, 340,000. Whoa. Way higher. We only see that result maybe once a quarter. Very, very high. Anybody with the slightest sensitivity, allergies, asthma, is going to feel miserable in this house. Wow. All from just a six-foot area rug. That's nuts. So you can imagine, if you've got a whole basement covered in carpet, uh, the kind of results you'll get. You know, in general, we talk about what you see is what you get. Look, if you don't see mold in your house, it's probably not growing. But this is the one exception, where if you've got vapor coming in through carpet, if you have carpet on top of concrete, you can have really high mold levels, but you won't see it. Mm. It's growing kind of deep in the fibers, and every time you walk across it, it's sending those spores up into the air, creating a big exposure, but you won't literally see fuzzy growth. Wow. So that, uh, that's the one exception to the what you see is what you get kind of rule that we use. Sure, and that's probably why you smell a lot of musty basements, right? Exactly, exactly, yep. Wow, that's crazy. Well, guys, I think that's pretty much um, the end of of the presentation, you want to go to the next slide real quick? Let's see so what we got this here. This is kind of just a summary um, of different things to be aware of in terms of what causes uh, different types of mold, um, condensation, like you said, and then also there's liquid where you know maybe the house flooded or something like that. But as you can see, guys, we could talk about this for hours on end, and we still wouldn't cover it all. Um, but it's really important that you need to hire the right professional when you come into problems like this terms of uh, mold remediation, even lead and asbestos, which we didn't cover today, but they also handle that. Environix also handles those things. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's my job as a real estate agent to have the right team in place to work with the, the right vendors um, and contractors who know what they're doing. As you can see, we, are, we discussed earlier too that some inspectors or contractors will actually misdiagnose the, pro the problem and the, the source of the problem. And so that could cost you thousands of dollars or maybe even kill a transaction if you're not hiring the right person. So I highly recommend you hire James Mallory when uh, you have any issues that you run into like this. Um, and if you're interested in buying or selling real estate, give me a call. Um, and then James, you want to tell them a little bit about how to reach you and what the best point of contact is for you? 
Sure. The best way is to go to our website. You can find our contact info there, depending on where you live. Give our office a buzz. Our office staff is super sharp. They'll be able to tell you whether it's really necessary to have us come out. And they'll be honest about that, for sure. Cool. And then our first step is always an inspection. Figure out the source of the problem. Put together a remediation plan, if necessary. And then send that off to the client. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, yeah. Once again, guys, hire the right professional. It could cost you otherwise. But uh, thanks for joining us on another episode of Ask the Experts. And uh, yeah, give us a call if you have any uh, real estate needs and uh, mold, asbestos, and lead uh, remediation needs as well. So thank you. Thank you.